Hello and welcome to the 14th episode of the Slot Podcast. Uh, if we'd planned this out better, you probably should have made some like cool improvised intro music on a keyboard that we'd set up in a sound stage. But if you've got a guitar in here, I can still do it. Do we have any guitars in here? There's three in cases over there, but I don't want to... Yeah, no. Maybe... Yeah, may, yeah. I was gonna say like maybe towards the end we'll we'll have a little bit of a. I'll just throw you a guitar and you can provide your answers in musical form. Sure, that sure. Sounds fantastic. Um, but yes, this is the first episode of the new year. Um, coming following on from the Christmas special which we had a, about a month ago where we got back all our previous guests. It was a it was quite a time. That's very sweet. And hopefully you will get to come back on the next Christmas special. I so can't wait. That should be very exciting. Only Given months away. If this goes well. Who knows? One of us could be dead. <coughs> we'll see what happens. Well, it depends on how much arsenic is in this water. Yes, very true. Um, basically, if you're new to this, this podcast com- comes to you from the Slop Shack, a strange new place where creators get together. Uh, we've launched Phase 2 and had a ridiculous amount of content released in the last month, so make sure to go and check it out um, and head to the theslopshack.com to fill yourself in with all of our little bits and bobs. Um, but basically, the Slot Podcast fills your ears with wild discussions, fascinating stories, and unique insights from Australia's most promising creators, including you, Mr. Finn Taylor. Do you have a nickname? Do you have a? Is there a uh, whisper in the wind that echoes through the Brisbane music scene when they hear? Uh, uh, fuck, not that guy again. Fuck this, I'm up. Perfect. That's, that's generally what they say. That's nice. That's yeah, it's nice. pretty good. <coughs> um, but yes, today we have Finn Taylor, musician, composer, um, extraordinaire, improviser. What would you? How would you describe yourself? I am a train enthusiast <coughs> that uh, plays some music on the side. Nice. That I'm also uh, the world's foremost expert in obscure Star Wars and Doctor Who lore. That's what yes. I actually do. I literally. That's my last question was about Doctor Who, but I oh want to really? get into it right now because you brought it up. Hit me. So, I finally got around to watching the New Year's special. I have not seen that one yet. It's <sighs> I've been watching the new season, though. It's not good. I've been having to force myself to watch the new season. Same. I, I, it's unbearably bad at times. You've activated my trap card here. Mm. I, I have a lot to say about the new season of Doctor Who. We don't have to say it here, but I would like to. Radio. Let's do it. Well, for um, all those who have come here to to find out about Finn's musical career, just just skip ahead. Uh, well, uh, Doctor Who's in a very interesting place because they've gotten the first female Doctor, which I think is fantastic. Exactly. And I think Jodie Whittaker is a wonderful actress. And that's why it's so frustrating that it's just not good. The writing is terrible. The writing is fucking boring. Chris Chibnall. Chris Chibnall is a talentless hack except for Broadchurch which is actually really good but anything in the Doctor Who world not good um, except for Torchwood Torchwood was alright uh, yeah it's it's. Um, I don't know I f- part of the appeal for Doctor Who for me is that the Doctor is quietly like one of the most powerful creatures in the universe yes and it, in this season they didn't use that very much no, they didn't. It, it was, was just like Sonic Screwdriver. Nerfed. Oh, hey. Yeah. She was like... I heard someone on Reddit say that she's like Graham's weird alien friend. Yep. Instead yeah. of like the main character. That makes sense. Know? That makes like, sense. But I think uh, my biggest qualm is with it at the moment, if I had to single out one thing, is how they do the solving the mystery scenes. Yes. Specifically how they shoot them. I was watching the episode. It takes you away. Probably and my favourite. That was... was Definitely. Whoa. That was actually my favourite episode of the entire season. It had one of the better scripts. It did, yeah. I, I think Because it wasn't written by Chibnall. You're right, it was not. Ed Heim. Badass. But they, they had one particular scene there where mm-hmm. the Doctor is solving the mystery and she's explaining it and it's just sh- shot, reverse shot, shot, reverse shot. And I was remembering like a, a tenant episode. Yes. They would shoot it from a bunch of different angles and he'd be walking around yes. and using Spinning. different things to demonstrate what he's talking about. He'd say... Well, da, 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 and it happens like this explosion. Yeah, it would be I punctuated agree. with things happening on screen. Hello. Which makes it uh, <clears throat> uh, a TV show instead of a radio play. Yeah, I agree. The, the, cr- the New Year's special has a particularly bad moment where 
like I was remembering to back to classic Who, and you you would kind of work the emotional drama and things in between scenes of action, or they would be in an interesting locale, or they would be flying along, you know, somewhere, and they'd get a bit of exposition, and then there would be an explosion, and they'd be interrupted. Instead, we get this scene between Ryan and his dad just in a coffee shop where he's trying to, like, barter this, like, microwave that he's built. And then it's just, like, a single close-up where they do a... Ryan does a big monologue explaining why his dad was never around. And then it's a single close-up about why his dad could never be around. And it's just, like... And then it cuts back to, you know, crazy stuff. But, like, it's just... It's like he, he came from this world of doing, like, murder mystery dramas. And he's trying to do that, but in just the wrong places. Uh, yeah. It's that so said, I haven't really... I haven't really enjoyed Doctor Who since since 1989. Left. Yeah, I yeah. I love Moffat though. I'm I'm a bit of a Moffat apologist, but I can understand the uh, the frustration. I I will have to completely disagree with you. Moffat is is I I wasn't a huge fan of him. Yeah, his uh I, I understand the whole fairy tale argument and but there is he kind of messes yeah. with the lore a bit. But but what was it? What was it that appealed to you about Moffat? I just loved how how he had to make everything so extra clever. Everything had to be uh, so profound and and ridiculous and like you'll never guess this solution. Um, but yes. I also just love that he he had a sense of humor that I appreciated and, and a pop culture sort of integration. I f- yeah, I feel it definitely made the show a lot more meta. Yes, yes. And I think that is kind of what it is. And your enjoyment of that will be based on whether you think. Doctor Who is the appropriate avenue to get really meta. Yes, fair enough. But yeah, no, I've been I've been reading this site called meshyfish.cl. It's a very bizarre uh, URL which I can't remember off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, that's <laughs> that would have been like three dollars on a domain site. Yeah, yeah, and it's it is just this plain text website with about five hundred pages, mm-hmm. which is just the law of Gallifrey. One guy's collated Damn. all all the all the uh, interesting points about Gallifrey mm-hmm. and uh, its history, and it's all y- you can read it all on Meshy Fish, and it's really interesting. The Doctor is actually a god that wow. decided that he wanted to be uh, a regular player in the universe, so he just turned himself into a regular Time Lord. Also, didn't know that the the Tardises are the actual superior race, and the Tardises just use the Time Lords. There you go. To, yeah, there you go. But I'm going to shut up about Doctor Who well, now because I'll uh, talk about it all day. It's interesting that you mentioned Doctor Who because you have a song titled Doctor Who released on your band camp, if you remember. Oh, I do remember that. That and was a very long time yes, ago. Yes, that would have been. Um, but I was I was kind of going through some of those oh, yeah. um, because I was like, I need to know who I'm interviewing tomorrow. And it was the best song that I'd listened to that day. So really? Congratulations. That's, that's very nice. Doctor Who was awesome. Um, so it's interesting that we brought it up. To segue into that, yes. um, that particular song became the basis of a musical that I uh, recently wrote. Oh, no way. What? I, uh, with a fellow called Chris Thomps- Christopher Thompson, who graduated from uh, the Conservatorium. Yes. I wrote the score for Don't Call Me Ishmael. Ah, uh, yes. If you've ever read that book, I got, to write, read the, I got to write the music for the musical. Wow, how was that? Uh, like you just you guys write it and then they performed it and uh, pretty the whole much, deal. Yeah. Yep. Well, I worked on the score. It was something like four hundred pages of manuscript. Jesus. I gave it to the gave it to the musical director and said, "Off you go." See, writing music is terrifying enough, but like you had to do it. How long? How long is the piece? Like the whole thing. It's, it's uh, the whole performance. It's about twenty five songs. Wow. So, it's so you just have to kind of just boom, like just nut that out. Scores, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's. The thing about songwriting is it's really not as creative and artistic as people think. You, it, mm. There is a process to it, and there are a certain number of things that you need to achieve. And once you do that, you can... <coughs> excuse me. Once you've achieved those things, it's fairly straightforward to go ahead and uh, write in the rest of the song. See, this is it's great that you brought that up, because uh, first thing, uh, I'll kind of just jump through some of your projects, and we'll come back to that later, but that's a point that I want to bring up, because you wrote about that in an article recently. I did. For Rue's Live Experience. Rue's Live Experience. Um, and I want to get back to that, because it was a really interesting point you brought up about the importance of musical theory. Um, but or first of the all... The unimportance of it, maybe. Or, or perhaps just, yeah, the, the kind of nebulous nature of it. Um, I wanted to just kind of give people a bit of an insight into, into who you are, in case they don't know. Um, 
basically you're a part of many different projects from what I've seen. Yes. Um, so many different bands and, and gigs and, and musicals and, and composing pieces. Um, so I will kind of just, I can do it roughly based on my notes, but I'd like you to kind of walk me through all the different things you've been associated with and kind of what they are and, and kind of who you are, I guess, as a, as a performer. Well, um, when I was 14, or maybe I was 13, I joined my first band. We did a gig with no practice at the now defunct Music Cafe, which <laughs> uh, some of your older listeners may remember, but nice. that is, uh, that closed down in 20, it was either 2012 or 2013. Wow, so this is, this is like a long yeah, time ago. This was a little while ago, yeah. And we had some awful gigs. Then we went on <laughs> and became a band called Dave is a Spy, which you can hear on davisaspy.bandcamp.com. And we've got some reasonably high quality professional recordings on there. Nice. Uh, Let's check it out. Which is far better than my solo band camp. It sounds infinitely better. Anyone who wants to listen to music, well, I you recommend go. you go on to davisaspy.bandcamp.com because those are my songs in full regalia with all yes. the little bits and pieces that I wanted to add to them. Uh, I played in a band called Ocean Leaves, which was a folk rock ensemble, did some smaller gigs and bands. I played accordion in a folk punk band for a while <laughs> and uh, all those sorts of things. Graduated high school, kept doing gigs. I started teaching music after I got out of high school, just doing private tuition, and that's sort of what I'm cu currently doing as a day job. Awesome. And outside of that, I have been writing the music for those musicals and working on some independent plays. Mm -hmm. I have also been wow. the sit-in uh, improvising pianist yes. for Roaring Twenties' silent film, where I sit and improvise a score for a silent movie Generally once every month, wow. which they're going to start up again this year. Where is that? Year. That's at Metro Arts Theatre. That sounds amazing. It's a lot of fun. I didn't know about this. We don't have a lot of pull. We can't do many shows because there aren't many people that show up. It is such a... Uh, I was going to say there aren't that many improvising p pianists, but... Well, no, no, but... but at least but of high quality. Just the, the silent film thing, It's that's a hard sell. Yeah, it's true. To get but it's not silent. You have music. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the idea. Awesome. Um, you mentioned uh, you were in a comedy duo just, just before when we were setting up. I used to be in a comedy duo. I used to be in a duo called The Finning Kelton Show with uh, my friend Kelton, who is now in Jersey, which is why we're not doing Yeah, I was going to say. Um, yeah. Wow, Jersey. And, and that was that was all right. We got to the state level of Raw, the national comedy competition. Wow, so there's we a national a comedy competition. Called Raw, yes. Wow, uh, that's amazing. It's run by the stand-up comedy club who also do the theatre sports. Ah, it's nice, that's nice. Guys. So, speaking of theatre sports, that's how that's how I com came to know you. Yes. Um, so, uh, luckily enough, back in the, the old man Jenkins days, which is like a long time ago now, mm. uh, you were lucky enough to score all of our games it was up until the, the grand final. It was a great honour of mine, yeah. It was awesome. Um, and yeah, that first night, that was the first time I'd ever done theatre sports was that first night. I think Joe and I had never done it before. And then the other two, oh, and actually no, majority of us hadn't done it except for two. And um, yeah, you were, you were so awesome. You you'd pick up on the themes. You, I I I was just so impressed with your opening sketch. Like I have seen so many opening sketches that are yeah. Oh yeah, that's clever. But the the full one hundred percent Looney Tunes esque pastiche of Have you ever talked about your your introductory piece on this podcast? Uh, I don't think so. I think. Uh, Actually, we haven't. We, I don't think we've ever explained why it was called Old Man Jenkins. I'm, I'm, I'm going to delve into that. Oh, there. thank you so much. These, these guys had a fantastic... Uh, in the theatre sports things, what happened is... what Theatre sports is uh, an improvising comedy situation where groups of kids have to improvise a scene based on a topic given to them by adjudicators. My job was to sit on the back and score, putting music under the scenes. Now, you get one scene to introduce a group that can be pre-planned and rehearsed. These guys had a scene where uh, they depicted the members of Scooby-Doo when they were all uh, old and decrepit. And <coughs> they had one particular gag where uh, Shaggy walks in holding Scooby, saying, Zoinks, guys, Scoob's totally toasted, yo. <laughs> Which point another member of the uh, ensemble exactly says... Right. 
Scoob's been dead for years. It must be the Alzheimer's playing up again. But you do it in the accent. Must be the Alzheimer's playing up again. Yeah. Of course, who is Scooby then? They pull off his mask and old man Jenkins. Extra old man Jenkins. Ah, uh, yeah. If that if that explanation didn't do it justice, it's because you had to be there. Yeah, basically. But uh, no, that's correct. Uh, I don't know how he came up with that, but it was a bit of a bit of a team effort. I think it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we had another one about it, like a love boat style intro. I'm glad that never went anywhere though. Oh yeah, my my pitch was the five skins, and we'd be like, "Wait, where's the four oh, skin?" And then it, yeah, it was it was oh. gonna be. Yeah, no. Thank God we didn't go for that. Yeah, see, it's been fantastic seeing you guys do those sports shows. I yeah. I, yeah. Particularly enjoy watching kids that can save scenes. Yes. Because the danger with those sorts of gigs is that uh, you can get into a point where you just devolve into uh, everyone reacting to a joke, yeah. but no one making Ma- a joke. Yeah, I agree. Which is where the scenes will devolve into just screaming. Yeah, that's uh, true. Off s- scenes done by girls will devolve into screaming. Scenes done by boys will devolve into like. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Uh, I remember just seeing like, one. Oh, let's do a flip. No, I don't like it a laugh. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it was you guys. It was another group that had a scene that had gone off the rails in that fashion. Yes. And people were screaming, and then <laughs> one of the kids in the group, just before the timer hit, saved it by turning to the audience and going, "Directed by Michael Bay." I swear, I like remember that. It was. That's yeah. so weird, man. You must have been there. Yeah. It so it was very clever. Speaking of being there, how did you end up with that gig? Did that just kind of happen? Like you, they kind of did you do theater sports back in the day, or did they just kind of hear about you? I got that you? gig through my old boss. I used to work at a place called Music Tech Academy for a, cool. a DJ called Pazaki. Nice. Is he still he, around? I believe so. And he works on. He works for. He works for those guys and. They contacted me and said, do you want a gig? And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll do a gig. That That's the entire story. And then that's the rest of your I, life now. Will I be knew a guy who knew things. a guy. Yeah. Which is this how you get into anything in the music industry. You know someone who knows Well, a guy. there you go. Well, uh, kind of speaking of things just kind of happening and going with the flow. Are you, are you big into improv as well? Like, obviously, you're doing improv. Improv you know, comedy? Improv comedy. Is this kind of a, something that you've been a big fan of? I've never had the chance to do it. Wow, I've n- I've never had the chance to. I didn't do drama in high school. There you go. Is it something you'd be interested in doing, or you just? I would love to. You know that you're good at music. I, n- I no, I th- I think the, I really like the idea of of doing some improv comedy. I I lie when I say I haven't done it before. I've done it at like age ten, age eleven. I've done it as yeah, a very small child. That's that's true. But no, there aren't a whole lot of opportunities. When you're out of high school, yeah, I was gonna say to yeah. go and do improv stuff, unless you're really keen on it and have the dedication to source out the groups and show up for the meetings every week, and mm, mm. and unfortunately, it's just yeah. But then, obviously, improv forms kind of a, a major part of your actual music making. Mm-hmm. Um, so, is that something that you would think is important as a performer? Do you think that that's something you need? Improvisation. Yes. Yes, definitely. Definitely. It's difficult, but I think like any aspect of performing, it can be compartmentalized. It can be proceduralized. Mm. Uh, Improvising music for scenes is very straightforward and at this point requires almost no brain power because I'm not improvising anything anymore. I'm regurgitating Mm -hmm. uh, themes for emotions. Because when you write or when you score a scene, you think, okay, what do I do to achieve this emotion? Yeah. What what kind of musical technique can I use to achieve the emotion of uncertainty or mm. sadness mm. or excitement or those are easy ones to do. What's a really what's a more abstract emotion? Um uh, ambivalence. <laughs> compartmentalizing anxiety. Yeah, so the the more specific <laughs> you get with the with the emotion, the more you can compartmentalizing anxiety, I would be playing i don't know i'd be playing clusters of notes in random spots on the keyboard so it sounds like lots of different things yeah yeah, yeah, at the yeah. Same time. compartments yes, see yeah. um i think you've segued into uh back into what i wanted to talk about which was your article that you wrote for ruse live experience yes um where you are talking about musical theory and, and sort of translating emotions into music 
yeah. sort of through that. Um, bit of a sort of background, I guess. Uh, Gru's Live Experience is kind of like a Brisbane music sort of yeah, it's a blog, I guess, that kind of has yeah. interviews and reviews and things. Um, how did you kind of, how did they approach you? And do you enjoy it? Is it, is it fun? Is I it do, fun? yeah. I've only written the two articles and then they kind of broke for the year. Uh, broke as in they they ha- went went on holidays. They didn't yep. uh, become dysfunctional. <laughs> uh, Rue is someone that I know from doing gigs in the Brisbane punk scene ages ago. Uh, the Brisbane, if you're not a really flashy good band, then you end up in the Brisbane punk melting pot. <laughs> yeah. We used to have a home ground at the New Globe Theatre, which is yes. now shut Closing. down. Closing. Um, are you going to the to the last big party I in April? Probably will. The New Globe Theatre is a very special place in my heart. Yes. There was nowhere else as like a 14-year-old musician that I could have gigs and have my friends be able to get in. Nice. Like that, that wasn't supposed to happen, but they... Is that kind of where you started? Is that where you, yeah. you sort of, you grew up uh, in a sense? Yes. Yeah. Doing gigs at the New Globe. So nice. it's got a very uh, special place in my heart in that sense. It is actually not that bad of a venue. If you get the good sound guy, there used to be a sound guy there called Eddie who had worked with Tom Waits. He was really wow. cool. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it's all about knowing people in the industry, I guess. Uh, 100%. Um, so yeah. So your first article was awesome. Um, and as a non-musician who still finds myself making music and kind of like writing songs or like kind of improvising songs with like loopers and things like that, mm. um, I actively try to avoid musical theory because I've always kind of hated it and yeah. I just I just love being able to, to get rid of the sort of like complicated nature of music making that it can be. Right, yeah. Um, but your piece was a really great eye-opener um, and I kind of, like as a person who is a feeling the music rather yeah. than understanding it, um, it was it w- kind of getting to see its importance and why being able to just know how to translate an emotion into yeah f- uh, sort of music was was really interesting. Well, yeah, and it, it's going to be it's always a personal thing, but uh, 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 music theory is just names, and if you know where C is on your instrument, that's music theory. If you know where the C chord is, that's music theory. There, there is you go. people th- people think that like at after a certain point it stops becoming names and starts to be theory yeah but that's not true it's just there labels there's no stuff. line the yeah. labels just get more and more specific wow okay. so like what you might call oh it's a c chord but i'm doing this mm. uh well the actual name for that might just be you know c add nine and the advantage there is that if someone else says what are you doing you can say i'm playing a c add nine as opposed to oh i'm playing this chord but i'm doing this just real quick are they all good all the cameras good okay sweet uh yeah no that's a uh, that's yeah, fascinating. It becomes yeah it's shorthand and it's it's it works across all of music too. It's not like you have to learn a different form of music for each instrument. It's well, kind of like you all of Western it. music at least. Oh really? That it's it kind of changes. Well, uh, overseas for instance, Indian music. Yes. In in Western music we have twelve notes. Wow. In Indian music they have twenty four. Okay. They literally have more notes than us. Damn, so they can play even more music than we can. Yes. Literally. Yes. They can play two songs in the amount of time it takes us to play one song because they have that many notes. That's actually really impressive. That's What a fun fact. Yeah, that's bullshit, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was the like, thing, what? The thing about the 24 notes is real. I don't know if it's actually 24. <laughs> if there are any classical raga players in the audience, I'm sorry if I'm completely butchering the... Uh, the fundamentals of your yes, music Yes, classic practice. raga instrumentalists, please write into the email just below. Raga is one uh, one form that I don't have a lot of experience with. The sitar is cool, but I... I, I honestly, like, I, what, should I know? Should I know them? Should Ra- I know? Raga. Raga. Raga, just think of, just think of stereotypical... I- nah. Um, <laughs> I'm just... How familiar are you with the Beatles, like psychedelic stuff? Yeah, pretty do you, familiar. Do you know Within You, Without You? Uh, vaguely. You know the like the George Harrison kind of yeah. The George Harrison like sitar pieces where he has lots of. That's the closest thing I can think of. Okay, well, I'll anyway, I'll be looking this up while I edit this podcast. Ragas are I'll cool. I'll be like, listening to it, but I great. I don't really know enough about them to speak about them at length. Yes, which is why I'm gonna. I was going to say, off. all right, well, but that's all right, because you mentioned in the article film composers. Yes. Um, and I kind of just wanted to ask, who are some of your favorites? What are some of your favorite film scores? Film scores. Any movies this year that kind of stood out movies in the musical realm? Or I've just any movies that you enjoy? I've seen some great films this year. 
That's good to know. Because um, there've been a lot of bad ones. Yeah, there have been some real, real stinkers. I saw, uh, man, Into the Spider Verse had a pretty interesting soundtrack. Yes, they, yes, yes, yes. It was interesting in a way. It was interesting in a Marvel is doing something a bit out of the ordinary. Yeah, this is I what agree. it sounds like when Marvel does something a bit out of the ordinary. It was like the Ragnarok soundtrack, not completely True. brand new, but different enough to be pleasant. Yeah, I think the soundtrack and the score were really good together as well. Um, and you can see bits of the score woven into the actual songs, like the original songs, uh, which is really cool. That said, um, outside of, I guess, films like... I don't count films like uh, recent Star Wars or Jurassic Parks, even though those franchises have some of my favourite themes written. Yeah, I agree. Because at this point, those franchises are actually no longer having themes written. It is uh, the, uh, f- for the Jurassic Park series it's in all particular. Just old stuff. Yeah. It's yeah, Michael Giacchino, Giacchino yeah. is hired to not to write a score, but just to a pastiche of a score, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, he's just reconstructing the old John Williams themes in a way that'll make us go, "Oh, remember yeah, Jurassic Park?" That's true. That said, although I'm that said, if it is John Williams and he is kind of making some new music, is it? Would you still classify that as the same thing, or is it still that this kind of nostalgia baiting that you? Uh, some of his new Star Wars stuff is good. Like uh, I feel like the can any Cantina scene, he whips out a new piece. March of March of the Resistance. Yeah. I do love that one. I actually like, like the first order. Like don't even remember. Oh, and the piece where Ray walks up the Jedi steps at the end. See, there you go. That actually has a really good. Three new things, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it is sort of still sort of the same sort of stuff. Um, well, ha- have you seen Aquaman? I have not. I saw the Half in the Bag review of Aquaman. Yeah, I, that's the Half I, in the Bag is the best. Yeah, I they didn't like it. No, it's it's a movie that is very like uh predictable and has like a pretty bad script and the lead actors shouldn't be the leads, but it's so visually awesome and I think the soundtrack was really good. It was both forgettable but like the best it was like they took the Thor Ragnarok score and then combined it with a sort of classic Hans Zimmer Man of Steel score and then added like Vangelis's Blade Runner music into it That's and then cool. a bit of Tron from Daft Punk and just kind of put that in a blender and you're just like, what the hell is going on? It'll go from like orchestral pieces to like... like and then like, it's really weird. I will say I'm not a fan of Hans Zimmer. You're not a fan of Hans Zimmer? No, I, I think he is. This is... Uh, uh, I think he is a hack. <laughs> I think he is uh, single-handedly killing film composition. Ha- please explain. Please. Okay. This, ha- this needs to... That is not the Pirates of the Caribbean theme. Mm-hmm. Hum me a Hans Zimmer melody. Hans Zimmer melody? A melody. Um, so, boah, it's not a melody. True, but then in time it's like, dun, 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 dun. The like single piano in- notes. Inception, yeah. I guess that's, is that a melody? You could call it. The what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that's, that again is, is kind well, of like. But because of the way film composition works, you actually have no idea if it's Hans Zimmer writing it or if it's just one of his interns that he's got to write it because he scores almost True. nothing anymore. Uh, he, yeah. Damn, really? He he does not write score. He just plays... Well, actually, that's that's an unfair comparison because most composers will operate just by playing directly into the DAW now. But uh, Hans yeah. Zimmer will outsource most of his writing to his interns. His themes are normally just two notes. Yeah, I was going to say Batman. If I think of a Hans Zimmer theme, here's what I think. But that doesn't mean that it sounds bad though. Like like it's like it it fits the 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 films that they that they're attached to, you know? Uh it fits the films that they're attached to in a cliché and superficial fashion. Damn. I appreciate you just I I have heard Hans Zimmer at all. At this point in my life, I can think of probably in excess of 50 action films where when an action scene starts, we have some variation of... Yeah, that's I am true. fucking sick and tired of the action drums. Give me a melody. The action drums. 
bump, 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 bump. There you go. Hans Zimmer, you can use that. That's fucking great. That's better than anything you've written in the last 10 years. <laughs> nah. Yeah, as that I say, was going to be my one exception. Interstellar is great. Uh, Absolutely phenomenal. Interstellar. Oh, okay. So you, you do have some moments where you, where you appreciate. I, I, I think good. he can. I think he can do great things. I think he needs to be limited. I think he needs to have limitations pl- placed around him. For the Interstellar soundtrack, it was fantastic because he was writing it almost entirely on the, organ. On the pipe organ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which forced him to use the textures of the pipe organ. Okay, so that's interesting. His textural composing, credit where credit's due, his textures are great. And I love okay. a good texture. <laughs> but it's not a melody. And when I hear film soundtracks, what I really want to hear is light motifs, mm, melodies for characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about he, um Yeah, okay. Think about Star Wars, Princess Leia. Ba da 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 uh the force. Mm, mm. Uh the clone army. Da 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 all these Classic. different elements have really recognizable yeah, melodies yeah, yeah, you're right. to them. And that is on the way out in film scoring. That's true. If you do think about it, yeah, it's like he kind of has one big, yeah, like theme for each of the films and then no real distinction between like different moments. That's an interesting point. I, Even with Interstellar, like, I'm one of the melodies. Yeah, well... I don't know. Dun, 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 right. dun, and it just it just builds dun, and builds. Dun, yeah, dun. you're right. Just rising notes in the minor scale. That's fine. That counts. Hans Zimmer, I'll give you that one. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Um, well, that's why I don't like Hans Zimmer. And while Michael Giacchino, to answer your initial question, which was what are my favorite film no composers? Um, well, it's actually really interesting that you did that because I was going to ask you about uh, your least favorite. Uh, artists, because I know that your favorite, at least as of the interview with Ruse Live Experience, was They Might Be Giants. Yes. Um, that's never going to change. Which are, which are fantastic. Are you going to see them in February? That's good. Yeah, yep. they're here in February. I think it's at the Triffid? Or? It's at the zoo. Ah, oh, there you go. It sounds good. But you mentioned something about uh, They Might Be Giants, about how they kind of showed you that being like bizarre and outlandish could be an actual job like it could be a that's not necessarily you being weird that can just be a reflection of who you actually are yeah 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 exactly um and so i felt like it's how does that kind of manifest in your work do you it seems like you're in a lot of different projects and Mm. the things that you enjoy is like sort of the concepts and and having like a cool sort of like backstory and kind of telling a story about like characters in a sense like yeah um story is very important yeah 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 so uh yeah like how does that sort of like you know how does your music kind of a reflection of, of yourself and like do you is p- being a part of so many different different bands just because you're interested in so many different things and you can't put them all in the one project yeah that's that's a very good way of putting it yeah um there are some genres that you just can't mesh my initial band i tried to do all the genres at the same time yeah it just people did not understand people didn't get it and so i think there is a, a level of simplicity that you need to have to a project for the project to be actually understood Mm. because uh, what you really want when you perform above everything else is for people to understand what you're trying to do. Mm. At the moment, the m- uh, most of my band time goes towards a band called Shakespeare and the Skeleton Gang, which Amazing. is a horror blues ensemble. So what's, what is horror blues? Horror blues is it's <laughs> blues, rock, and related genres. Okay. So we go sort of to both to where the most extreme ends of what you could define as that yeah with themes of traditionally cheesy horror elements it's wow. not actually frightening it's not meant to actually scare yeah, you. scary it's meant music. to be sort of like the halloween silliness thing uh, okay but so it's okay yeah That's cool. it I'll the listen to it. lead singer is plays a character called Shakespeare, who is an immortal time traveling hobo every time he dies he wakes up at a different time and place Right, and obviously. his band accompanies him. They don't have that same power, but they accompany the skeleton him. Skeleton gang? Yes, right. on his exploits by walking through holes in the plot to find wherever Shakes currently is. They right, yeah. so they're kind of this like omnipresent sort of meta band, and then he's like trapped he, in time. Or he's. Yeah, uh, heaps of our songs end with Shakespeare just dying. And then he wakes up and in like a new place. Up, yeah, yeah. And wow. then play the next song. So you just kind of tell this story sort of through the music over time, I guess. Y- yeah, and there are little breaks of dialogue in between the in between the uh, the, s- oh, nice. the s- tunes. Because in my head it was going to be like kind of album by album, he goes to a different place. But you just having it like him just dying all over the place. It's just yeah, no, he's not story. very good at staying alive. There you go. 
That's awesome. I need, where can we check out Shakespeare? In the you can find us on SoundCloud. We currently have a song called Dr. Skinner's Surgery up there, which I'm very pleased with. Okay. About a plague doctor Dr. who Skinner. performs vivisections. It's very grisly. All right. I'll check that out. Mm. Uh, but I but I, I appreciate, um, yeah, the, the, the storytelling behind it. Do you think, is that sort of something that people should be aware of? Is like, you know, like, if you don't try and cram everything into the one sort of piece, like you were saying. Yeah. I like, you're, it's okay to have multiple different projects to kind of do different things. Yes, yeah. And it, it, it depends on the expanse and the style of story you want to tell. Mm. Um, and you can tell very personal stories through very sort of elaborate and involved metaphors mm -hmm. that allow you to tell two stories at once, almost. There you go. Which is a... Uh, it's a, it's an interesting device to use, but uh, story is conveyed just as much in music as it is in lyrics, mm. so it has to be an ensemble thing. There you go. Um, That's well. Then speaking of that, um, as a, I, I'm a non -musi non musician, obviously, uh, which is interesting that I've been doing so many interviews with musicians because I kind of find it fascinating. Like it's just something that I couldn't do. Um, but I kind of wanted to know, like, what's the experience? Like, you're in a band. Is it kind of like do you kind of get together once in a while and someone will pitch something or is it more of a leader or like how do bands get together and make music? You know what I mean? Like, is it a lot of experimentation? How does it happen? Changes from band to band. Um, again, depends on how the big defining factor for me has always been how educated in theory your band has been. If your band, if your bandmates don't know theory, then one song will take you guys a month to learn. Uh, there you go. Uh, but but that's an extreme generalization. It's uh, for for me. It's always been theory because I communicate in theory. There are bands that will do arrange songs completely non-verbally through just feel. Yeah. Uh, a band like that, I would uh, I would take as an example is Blink One Eight Two. Okay. Blink One Eight Two is a really good example because it's so apparent that the three uh, band members are just writing little little parts except for Travis Barker the drummer who writes huge parts um, yep. uh, Tom and Mark will write guitar parts that almost have nothing to do with each other <laughs> right uh, no most of Tom's guitar parts are just one or two notes almost a direct couple of the bass the bass will just walk around on the root notes that is the sort of music that is you can write without having to know any theory whatsoever there you because go. you can show your fellow guitarist, oh, I'm just putting my fingers here. You can do that too. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And but the, I guess it works yeah. in some cases. Like the, that's the opposite end to that spectrum would be someone like Beethoven, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> who has fair um, who creates all the parts for all the instruments. Yeah, has an idea of what he wants everything to do and where it all to go and build nice. to. That's I. He's not really a band, though. True. When I When I get together in bands, I actually write sheet music out. Nice. For a, lo a lot of the things. That's unusual. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it seems like most of the bands that, w that I've sort of, you know, been exposed to, yeah, it's more of a feel thing. It, it is totally more of a feel thing. And most rock bands, most rock bands that you hear on the radio won't know theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most bands, most singers don't know how do theory. they how do they then work with like producers and other bands when they're kind of putting together music is it is it, it just or everyone's on the feel sort of because like nowadays a whole lot of the problems that you would initially have to solve with knowledge of theory can be solved through music technology yeah for instance uh <laughs> having unbalanced volumes between guitars in a band you've got two guitars playing notes that are too close to each other and the harmonics are oh. the harmonics are interfering back in the day you might be like, okay, how will we fix this? Let's actually score the harmony out. We're going to put these guitars on thirds apart from each other and they're going to be locked in thirds all the way. But nowadays, you would fix that after you record it in the workstation. Because oh, you can just do yeah, that. You can just, you yeah, can just go through and, and keep going till it sounds correct. So do you think that uh, the digital age music sort of lost a bit of its its uh, its charm? Or is, it, is, it, is it too easy now? Or do you think that it, the accessibility is, is kind of important for the sustainability? Of I, th I, think, I think it is neither good nor bad. I think it is what it is. You and just have to deal with it, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, it will be very interesting to see how that changes the musical landscape in the next few years. At the moment, 
uh, Electronica is really in. Yeah. But I'm going to be interested to see what happens once we have the... It's, I reckon at the end of the 20s, yeah. as in the 2020s. This 20s, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the Whoa. 20s, we're going to see like a... Some Roaring kind 20s of, be too. Some kind of... It'll be like a chiptune revival period. Oh, you reckon? Where chiptunes and bands like I Fight Dragons and Geek Rock come back in. Yes. That's, that is the hope that I have in my heart of hearts. That's the shit. But man. I think there will be some kind... You know, there were real people playing real instruments... As my friend Dean Hamilton once said, will always have a novelty to it. Nice. You're always <laughs> going to be able to, yeah. It'll never go out. Draw of a crowd with real people playing real instruments. Um, yeah, no, I agree. That's nice. So then, speaking of kind of the the music landscape and where we're at, mm. do you have any tips? Because it seems like you're, you're you're way through all the way through the industry in lots of different ways. <laughs> Not um, really. But I mean, if you think about it, like you're composing musical like theater, and you're you're doing improv theater, and mm. you're doing. You're in all these different bands, <coughs> um, but you're obviously more attuned to it than than I am. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any tips for like upcoming musicians, if they're listening, things that kind of work. You said get knowing people is probably the most important thing, but just any kind of general like, especially Brisbane related things. Yeah, um, know people, suffer through local gigs. The gigs will be terrible. The bands will suck. Suffer through them. Uh, talk to the w- the guy from the one good band that you saw that evening and get yes. in another bill with them. Talk to venue owners. Be really friendly. Um, know your shit. Don't ban practice on stage. It know your songs. It is fine to have simple, simple songs that you can play. If you need to write, if you need for some arbitrary reason to be completely stone drunk while on stage, write songs that are simple enough for you to be able to pull <laughs> them off when you do that. Yeah, I have, true. I have, uh, I have been in bands where, <clears throat> you know. Uh, their routine was to get just completely written off before they went on stage. Mm, and mm. I think that isn't even necessarily a bad thing. It's just a very interesting way of uh, interpreting how you're going to play your own music. Yeah, I guess it's, that's got to be part of the plan, right? You know, you know what I mean? Like Getting caught. Yeah. It's part of the plan. Yeah. There you go. <sighs> nah, that, I, I couldn't make that land. That was That was a... That was a Bane reference, but I couldn't quite get it to land. Yeah, no, I was like getting caught. I was like, mm, it's part of the plan. But can we just? I know Ashley here is a massive fan of Bane. Can we just talk in the Bane accent for like the rest of this interview? Not going to plan who I was till I put on the mask. No, I, no, everyone does a terrible Bane voice. You can't do a good Bane. Let's voice. roll. Bane is the best. Yeah, there's a there's a point at which there's too much muffling. It's got to be enough that you can hear it, but like enough that it's sort of obscured in a way. You know what I mean? I love Bane's voice. That is a master master work of audio engineering. Can you imagine voice. like like Chris Nolan like sitting there and it's like he's having a meeting with with Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy like jumps in. and He's like, "Hey man, I came <laughs> I came up with the voice for Bane." He's like, "All right, cool. I only just hired you like yesterday." He's like, "No, no, I got like really like smashed and like I just I nailed it." I was looking at the comics. I just heard his voice in my head, and he's just like. The angle of the hypotenuse is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's just like, let's roll. And he's just like, all right, let's do it. If I pull those off... Damn, I wanted to... Will you die? Yes. Thought so. And this is the point where our viewers at home are completely in on the very obscure joke that we're making and you guys just just piss your pants laughing now here watch this one two three boom oh someone actually laughed if you didn't get the joke please write in at the email address below and we'll uh we'll work that one out death threats to uh uh parliament house yeah through us we'll forward them on to you for you yeah um we, we, what were we talking about that got us onto the Bane tangent? I don't know. You someone, someone Lenny, was part of the plan. Ga- Brisbane Getting gig, just the yeah. That's that, tips, tips. That's my tricks. advice. Uh, no, no your shit. Write songs. Write songs with melodies with a catchy melody. Uh, the way I like to do that is you find a phrase and then you melodify it. I don't know. Give me a random phrase. Um, pineapples suck. Yeah, sure. 
dun 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 pineapple suck dun 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 pineapple suck dun dun pineapple suck dun dun pineapple suck if you repeat that long enough it will become catchy just through pure repetition yeah that's but true but you need to repeat it in the same way oh i was reading a book by uh, i think it was uh i think it was stravinsky no it wasn't stravinsky i Arnold Schoenberg's uh, Principles of Modern I was Composition. Say J. Michael Straczynski? And he okay. he said something along the lines of repetition is the crux of f- the form of music as we know it. Yeah, I was going to say it is. Repetition just alone gives rise to monotony. Monotony can only become be overcome through variation. So it has to be both repetitive and boring to then, but with hints of variation, it needs to be repetitive but not boring. Right. A really so it's yeah. How does that? How does that happen? Then? A really good example would be um, the start of Smoke on the Water. Funnily enough, <laughs> yeah. so you've got the very repetitive bam 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 bam. It starts off as just a guitar. Yeah. Now, if the song was just that, if the song was just that solo <laughs> guitar playing <laughs> that riff for four minutes, the song would not have been a hit. But what happens is the second time they play it, they have a bass come in underneath. Yeah, okay. And they bring in the drums. Then it goes into a more standard blues groove and they return to that riff. Every time they return to it, they make it sound slightly bigger. Ah, so it's about finding ways to, to, to build yeah. upon the repetition. Yep, there should be a, a curve and a story progression to a song in the same way that there is to a story or a, a narrative yeah, yeah, or yeah. anything. Beginning, really. middle and end. That's beautiful. Well, speaking of the end, mm. we have we have drawn upon the ending of the podcast. I but see. I wanted to see if there was anything you wanted to bring up before we before we finish this. Any um, any any things that have been troubling you? Yeah, my breakfast. It was really bad, and I'm gonna bring it up right now. Yeah. Okay. What did <coughs> you have for breakfast? The the joke is that I'm gonna vomit. Yeah. Uh, the joke. Audio is listeners, the joke was that he was going to vomit. I didn't actually vomit though. Because well, not yet. Because I'm a pleb. If I was not a pleb, I would have just been able to spew on your table here. It would have been really funny. Yeah, that actually would have been really good. And everyone would have been like, how did you do that effect we threw up? You know, that should definitely become a part of your routine. Like, I think just throwing, throwing up. up on stage. Like you said, you know, you, you want to plan to be written off. You should now be planning to be... I don't want to plan to be written no, off. No, 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 but like people, <laughs> people who are getting written off. Yeah, yeah. So you should just plan to just vomit. As a part of the show, I think that could be a whole new project for you. Welcome to Finn Taylor's Vomitorium. Uh, it, that's a new article right there. <laughs> that's actually the title of this episode. The Vomitorium. The vo- Finn, Finn Taylor's Vomitorium. Uh, very good. I'm glad that I'm glad that's finally gotten some traction. Awesome. So thank you so much for coming on. We've no had, worries. We've had a fascinating chat. Thank you're, you. You're a fascinating me. man with fascinating insights into a fascinating culture called music. <laughs> Anything you'd like to plug before we leave? Um, I've probably got a gig coming up that I should plug, but I can't remember where it is. Uh, <laughs> if you... that Shakespeare and the Skeleton Gang is a Facebook page and Instagram account. Is it, is it like a Shakespeare the, joke in there? Yes, it's, it's a Shakespeare. Right. Shakespeare, S-H-A-K-E-S okay. space F-E-A-R. Oh, there it is. Shakespeare. Okay. So yeah, uh, you're performing with that. Should people just go to Finn Taylor Music on Facebook? People should go to Shakespeare and the Skeleton Gang on Facebook, and also Finn oh. Taylor Music. Nice. With both of those pages, you can like both of them. If you press like, your account will like it, and then Facebook has this thing where, once you like a page, it then shows you stuff from that page. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Facebook. It's fascinating. And Dave is a spy. Where should? Where is Dave is a spy? Dave is a spy. Is Dave is a spy? It's one word, but it it should be a phrase. On bandcamp.com. So davesaspy.bandcamp.com. That's all right. That awesome. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I'm no definitely going to go home and listen to all your music. I hope people out there do as well. Have fun. And I hope to see you in the coming year at some various theatre sports gigs along Absolutely. the way. Absolutely. Um, it should be a lot of fun. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Will go have some a better breakfast. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much for checking out episode 14 of the Slot Podcast. Um, next month we shall have a very special guest on but until then go back and check out Slack 7 with Alex Falconer go back and check out our new podcast Movies of the Future episodes 1 and the special before episode 2 comes out on February the 4th which should be in about a week and a half Um, other than that head to theslotjack.com to find 
all of your latest updates about what's going on in this strange little hut that we have. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for continuing to listen into 2019. We'll see you very shortly. Have a great day. What's a, what's a good sign off? What's a good phrase for a sign off? You do the outro music. Let's 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 make this make this happen. <laughs>